this guy was he 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 designed the municipal building gardens. I mean, every judge, sheriff, police chief, every cop knew his face from wandering around. And he was a friendly, kind of charismatic, unassuming guy. And all of a sudden, we're looking at him and saying, you're telling me that he's been sexually assaulting 32 children for years and we don't know about it? Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Larry. Welcome to Manipod, a podcast dedicated to men over 50. Brought to you by Manipause.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Manipod podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, and we're going to talk about evil, religious cults, true crime, and even King Tut's murder. Remember Jonestown, Heaven's Gate, the Branch Davidians, the Manson family, all evil cults that led to tragedy and death? Maybe less remembered, but just as horrible was the Zion Society cult in Utah, a deviant polygamous cult. Our guest today, Mike King, is a former police officer who led the investigation and the takedown of that cult. And he's written a best-selling book called Deceived, an investigation memoir of the Zion Society cult. It's a must read, as you can see. And he has a very popular podcast of his own on YouTube called Profiling Evil that investigates cults and crimes. Welcome, Mike. Hey, Larry, thank you so much. And Mike, I, I just love you guys. I've been watching you now for about two months. And at times you got me actually laughing and other times I'm really scratching my head, but you're doing just such a, such a cool job. And it's so fun to be able to hang out with you for a bit today. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Well, we're please. really excited. We're really excited you're here because it's an interesting topic yeah. that we haven't covered yet. And so I'm going to get the first question. And as I said, I read your book. Uh, once again, here you go. It's available on Amazon. We're going to have the link there. It's really good, but the story is really horrific. So let's talk about your involvement in taking down that Zion Society cult. I mean, this was a deranged sex and pedophilia cult led by a sicko who, on the face of it, didn't look like someone people would follow blindly, as you describe in the book. How did you get involved in taking them down? <laughs> you know, this, this is the most, uh, even now when I look back, the most incredible thing to me, because I, I, was, I was living the investigator's dream. I was working an undercover sting uh, team. We were buying and selling stolen vehicles, and we were working our way up the, the chain, trying to get into the kingpins of a, a major organization selling and stealing vehicles. And one day I happened to walk into the district attorney's office and uh, the, the receptionist grabbed me and said, hey, there's nobody else available. Will you just take a moment and talk to this woman pointing to a, a, an attractive 20 something year old girl who was sitting over in a corner reading a magazine? And, and uh, you know, I don't know, maybe I was just the bottom rung on the ladder that nobody else was available, but I had no experience <laughs> in what I was about to be uh, launched into. And, uh, and I walked over and I uh, said, did you need to talk to someone? And she stood up and she said, I've been involved in a cult of sexually abusing children. Do you have a minute? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, cow. Yeah. I just, uh, you know, you try to act like uh, you hear this thing every day, but yeah. my mind was just running a thousand miles an hour. Wow. Wow. So let's have you define a cult because it, you know, you, you, it's a group that changes from a movement to a cult and why is it important to, to follow cults, religious cults? You know, the thing that's so intriguing about cults is there, there are, I would say legitimate kinds of cults. You know, I, I, I like the Green Bay Packers and, and uh, I, ha I have a, a flag that has the Packers. And I still think that, that uh, Roger Staubach from the Cowboys was a really important guy. That, that, that's kind of a cult mentality. I follow an ideology and a, and a system of thinking, but what we're really interested in is destructive cults. The, mm -hmm. the, the groups that are led by, um, most often a charismatic leader who somehow gets a hold on people and convinces them that everything that they say or do is in this case, in a religious cult from God and, and perhaps even God's 
speaking, which is so wacky to think about when you think about uh, those of us who seem to have balance in our life and, and we have an understanding. But, but the real difference between a destructive cult and something other than, let's say, mainstream religion, mainstream religion is all about uh, a heavenward God or, or, um, or what Buddhism believes in or, you know, whatever the belief system is, but it's outward thinking of something else and, a, and something to attain, but it's all about kind of lifting and blessing the lives of others where a cult is all about the leader and, mm-hmm. and surrounding them with everything that's good. Well, and so I think- the, the sorry, uh, the young girl that came to you um, to came to talk about it. How does she break out of that? She knew it was wrong to begin with, and then she was brainwashed. And then what happens? You know, that's really intriguing because some of the things that we cover in the book, well, we didn't want to get into the seedy, sensational, you know, stuff that happened. We wanted to talk about this whole behavioral thing that occurs. And, and it's really interesting because we used to think that just stupid people got involved in cults. And we've seen that that, that isn't the case when we look at Nexium or, or well, there's just so many to choose from. But but the thing that was so intriguing is, is these cult leaders are looking for people that are going to bring something to the table. They don't want another project. They don't want a welfare case. They don't want another mouth that they have to feed. They want somebody that's uh, going to bring something. Sex. I always say sex, money, or drugs. You know, um, what, what are they bringing to the table? And, and sometimes these people, when they come in, give everything they have to the cult and to the ideology And then once they've used that person up, once they have nothing more to offer, unless they can continue to bring some value to the organization, they're cast off. Every once in a while, some of them recover, get a conscience, maybe get their head cleared out a little bit, and they say, holy cow, what have I been believing in? And then they they choose to leave on their own. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, is that in reading this story, uh, uh, the, the main character is a guy named Arvin, who is highly unimpressive as a <laughs> as a as somebody that you feel you'd roll into and say, "Oh, this guy is touched by God. He's he's an inspiration." Uh, apparently, and you interacted with him. Apparently, he had a way of communicating that was a little bit mesmerizing. But uh, 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 but we've all met people like that at first. And then when, once you kind of get past that, you can see, oh, they're flawed or they're stupid or they're, you know, l- looking to get something. So a guy like this, uh, and tell us a little bit more about the story, about how he was able to kind of get these, these people who were desperate or down and out or in a lot of cases just lost and keep them. Because, again, he was kind of creepy and kind of unattractive and, and all that kind of stuff and how he was able to convince them that he was, you know, God or a prophet of God. Uh, how, how were you able to get through that and, and figure out how they kept supporting him? You know, I remember the first photo I saw after, after this woman, Aaron, described what was going on in the cult. And in our minds, you know how we kind of create the monster before we get to see it. Yeah. Uh, or, or you think about people that are involved in like, online dating, the person they actually meet at the coffee (laughs) shop, isn't it all like the photo or something else? Well, I'm looking at this photo thinking, how on earth is this dumpy old gardener? And, you know, we're all now his age at the time he was pulling this thing off. But how is this guy somehow convincing 120 plus people to have sex with him on a regular basis, to give him all their money, to do his bidding. It it just made absolutely no sense. And so um, you have to kind of pull back the reins and start saying, now, there's this incredible story that I've heard, but what can I back it up with, with real evidence? Because number one, it's not against the law to be crazy or to have a wacky ideology, But the moment you start abusing children or sexually assaulting adult women or other kinds of things, then those are things you can build a case on. So you start looking at it. But this guy was he 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 designed the municipal building gardens. I mean, every judge, sheriff, police chief, every cop, 
knew his face from wandering around. And he was a friendly, kind of charismatic, unassuming guy. And all of a sudden, we're looking at him and saying, you're telling me that he's been sexually assaulting 32 children for years and we don't know about it? That is yeah. so sad. Um, how, how in the world does he go about picking his, let's call them victims for, for lack of a better word. How does he pick them out? Yeah. I mean, he, he is the perfect example of a marketing and sales expert because he is out constantly. He had this goofy, uh, belief that he classified as revelation from his God. And I always say his God, cause it's not the God that I believe in that would support that. And uh, he, he had this thing that he called the thread. And he said that each man, if he's been given this God-given gift to have multiple wives, would have a thread. For Arvin, it happened to be um, a certain kind of lingerie. For uh, his son, and it's kind of interesting, you know, the the uh, cool guys in the group always are the ones that God gives revelation can have multiple <laughs> wives, but the, the guys that are problematic, you know, they haven't quite risen to the level yet, mm -hmm. but uh, one was uh, high Hills. And, and uh, so they would then drive around the community. They would look for people that fit a, um, a profile that they actually created. The, the profile they wanted was they wanted uh, divorced or going through divorced women who were living in um, really rough circumstances, you know, living in uh, government housing or other kinds of things that had children, primarily female children. And they would start to surround them with love and say, hey, we have a great place where we can kind of help you. We have friends who will step in and care for your children while you get on your feet. And they spoke to, you know, you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They spoke to the hierarchy of need, of that need to, to uh, have their physiological needs taken care of, to have belonging and love. And people just sucked right in. And, and it was a masterful plan because you think about it, some mom that's got two or three kids and a husband that won't pay his child support or an ex-husband. All of a sudden, she's got someplace that's really beautiful saying, hey, you can live in one of our rooms and we'll give your children a chance to get an education in our homeschool. And, uh, and all you got to do is just work and kind of pitch in and give us your money from your job. And, uh, and when you get back on your feet, then you go off. And all of a sudden, the hook is set and, uh, and these kids can't get out. Hmm. Yeah. And it's like with Erin, I know she... Um her story is compelling in the sense that she knew even going into it, that there was something wrong about it. And it's almost like an abused wife who always makes excuses for the husband. Well, you know, I did piss him off or he had a bad day at work or he's normally not like that, you know, while she's walking around with a black guy, right? Yeah. Because she's afraid of losing financial support of, you know, losing the children or whatever. And those are the kind of people that, you know, he seemed to be pulling in. And, um, uh, and Aaron was cognizant of the fact that, you know, there's something wrong here, but the alternative for me is not very good. And so she stayed. Yeah. Isn't that tragic that they get so trapped? I, I remember a family that I dealt with, they had um, eight children. They were all girls. And the father, stepfather, was sexually abusing the girls. The mother pled with me not to file charges against him because she didn't want to be destitute and out on her own. Yeah. That would have been the perfect target for Arvind Shreve. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I have two questions for you. First, are all the cult leaders men? Have you ever run into a cult leader that's a woman? That's number one. And number two, how do you bust these people if there isn't a whistleblower? What mistakes do they make that you can catch them? Yeah, that's a, such a great question. So think back just a few months ago, uh, there was uh, a, a woman uh, in the Love Has One cult in Colorado 
that uh, they ended up mummifying her and they were packing her around the country after she died in a little shrine that they had. She had incredible power over the members of her cult and uh, kind of an interesting cult to read up on. And we did a couple of shows on it, but really interesting. Another really interesting one is a case I worked uh, called The Family in Australia. And it was the Anne Hamilton Byrne case. And she had this huge complex, millions and millions of dollars uh, in value properties all over the world. And, uh, and she led this organization and all they ever were able to do is arrest her on a financial crime, never on all the abuse of the children and the cells of the children and trafficking that was going on. And so what you have to do, if you get someone that you don't have someone that steps forward is you have to look for the chinks in the armor, the violations of, uh, of maybe government resources for women, infant and children abuses or welfare abuses or things like that. And we saw this a lot in Utah in the polygamy problems that the state faced back in those days. And I think continues to, but, but now we've legalized polygamy and it's a little more difficult, which is peculiar. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. Um, And, and, you know, we never really chased polygamists. We, we thought, okay, if an adult is dumb enough, in my opinion, not in theirs to to engage in that, then you know what consenting adults should do what consenting adults do. But when it it always seemed interesting to me that these self-proclaimed prophets when all the when all the good looking ladies in the group kind of started dissipating, then they started getting revelation that younger and younger people should become then their spiritual wives, which only meant that there was going to be sexual assault in in many cases, in my opinion. But but the difference was we we looked at those cases from the standpoint of there are generational cults. And there are what I call convert cults. And some people in the in the cult industry disagree with me on this concept, but <laughs> I don't know that many have investigated as many polygamists as I have. And uh, what I found was that a generational cult that raises a child to believe in ideology and uh, a hierarchy of control, they're, they are so difficult to get a chink in the armor that you can exploit and and try to bring justice to children or or women who or other adults. The convert groups, on the other hand, the guys like in this case, Aaron, who come in with an idea that somebody's going to bail them out, make their life easier. And then reality sets in and they say, holy smokes, what have I been involved in? Mm -hmm. Those are the groups like Aaron that will come out and say, "Uh, I'm going to tell you about what's going on in that group. Well, there, I remember there was a, a preacher, a uh, woman, Catherine, something or other, that was on TV all the time. And it was the same sort of thing where she had all these followers. They thought that she was, uh, you know, like the second coming of Christ. And and they gave all their money to her and worshipped her even after she died. Right. And uh, yeah, and I, I can't remember what her name is, but, you know, you see all that. But it seems like to to lay people that. I mean, there are really there are really two uh, purposes for these cult leaders. One is power, of course, but the other seems to be sexual. I mean, it's very unusual, I think, in most cults, whether you talk about Jonestown or the Branch Davidians in particular with David Koresh, that's what that was all about, too. He was sleeping with young kids, young girls and all that. It seems like it's a certain personality that wants power and control and as much sex with as many people as possible. Yeah. Isn't that something? And, you know, as you were talking, it triggered me to something that you kind of alluded to early into the interview that I didn't really address. And that is how did this Arvin become the, the predator that he became? Um, One, one thing that I testified uh, in the trials about was the fact that I don't, by for a moment that this is about religion. In fact, what we did is we were able to go back into his history and uh, we found out a, a number of things that he had had sexual relations with an aunt when he was a young person. He really enjoyed those experiences. Um, that wasn't his fault that they did that probably, but it kind of started a cascading event. Um, but then he talked about over and over again about going to the local high school football games and walking up and down in the stands so that he could look up the skirts of the, of the young girls in the stands uh, that 
when he was purporting this religion and that God was instructing him to do things, he was in Salt Lake City buying hookers uh, every Friday night. And, uh, and so you'd say to him, but now tell me how on earth you can justify going and purchasing um, sex workers when you're purporting that this is all about religion and spiritual. And, and, and he reflected on a time when he told his wife, I don't want to do this, but God's instructed right. you. I, I she's that, dumb yeah. enough to say, well, right. okay, you know. And she was actually then, um, she kind of became in the low portion of the hierarchy because she was not, in his mind, attractive or uh, ambitious enough. So she kind of kind of put down as somebody who would just sort of manage all the people, but not have anything to do with promoting it and all that, which was Exactly. She, she yeah. maintained the rights of being his first wife. But when a cuter, younger girl came along, God directed him, his God directed him to, to uh, obviously take the younger, better looking wife that could bring more to the table. And she's minimized in her role, but she doesn't stop being a groomer of these children, uh, talking to them, preparing them for their first sexual uh, escapade with Arvin, the 62 year old man and saying to him, what a wonderful, you know, bone chilling experience this is going to be for him, just like it was for her, her first time. I mean, give me a break. I get so <laughs> angry when I talk about this fellas. Mm. Well, let me ask you, is, is there any current cults out there that, that we should all be aware of that's that are happening. They've been going on for years that, we we just need to be aware of or have or haven't been labeled as cults. Yeah, in your opinion, maybe are. Yeah, you know um, there are probably, uh, according to the experts, about five thousand globally at any time that are destructive cults that are worth paying attention to. Some are two or three members, others are larger, and uh, and so yeah, it really um, becomes so incumbent upon us as parents friends and others to constantly preach transparency in relationships. You know, if you have a loved one who's going with somebody that's kind of wacky and every time you say, I'm a little uncomfortable about that person, they get defensive. They need to start hearing transparency is really important. You know, somebody that's trying to isolate uh, people from their support system, man, that's, that's the, the driving force behind these you know, cults to get people separated and, and then uh, teach them the ideology. Hi, Mike and Larry here, inviting you to spend some time at manopause.com. It's a website dedicated to men over 50 and the people who love them. That's right. Articles, videos, podcasts, and a community forum all here at manopause.com. Hey, are you tired of everything from movies to fashion always being aimed at millennials? I know I am. Well, at menopause.com, we focus on you, guys over 50, with stuff you care about. Like sports, sex, humor, health, entertainment, and business. It's all here. Manopause.com. Manopause.com. It's about time. Join the movement. So what about, uh, you know, again, just to throw something out there, because it's been on TV, uh, and there's, you know, there's differing opinions, uh, something like Scientology, for instance, right? Uh, we had this big expose by uh, Leah uh, Remini uh, about, about why she feels it's a cult. And she was a member for 15 years. Um, and, and yet it's still not really pegged as that because of so many people that are involved with it who seem respectable and, and all that kind of thing. So you, you deal with something like that and some of these people are rescued from there, but they, they go through what you're talking about where that, that organization, if, if the parents or friends don't agree, they're told you got to pull away because that's, that's a negative effect on you. So where do you cross the line to say, well, you know, it's, it's some sort of religion or no, 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 this is a cult. Uh, and what's the importance of labeling it as such? Because it seems like people who get sucked into it wouldn't care even if you told them it was a cult. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough thing. And, and those big organizations are, um, 
are really intriguing to look at and hear the stories that come out. And you can argue that Leah Remini was doing that out of spite. Well, you know what? To the people that were rescued out of that, it mm-hmm. didn't seem like spite. Right. Um, so, so you have to look at those and you have to say that old adage of if there's smoke, there may be fire. You know, what really is going on? And that's why I push so hard for transparency. And and you know what? If if a group's doing good, they ought to be like standing on the rooftop shouting out, we're, we're doing good. But if the group is being secretive and closed off and won't respond and won't open the kimono, um, that always gives me a little bit of a feeling of concern because why aren't you, you know? Um, now, I, I don't have a problem with a, a religion that says, hey, something is so sacred, we don't talk about it publicly. O- okay. But does- well, like the Mormons have that with with their uh, the big churches, go. right? Just, just any Joe can't get in there. But, you know, it's not like they're sacrificing people in there or anything like that. It's just part of their organization that says you have to be this level of uh, in the hierarchy to be able to go in there and do this, uh, you know, and see it and all that. Uh, but we know that there's nothing going on there because they when they open these things, they let everybody go through it and tour it and all that. Uh, but but again, it's one of those kind of trigger points where it's sort of like, hmm, wait, what? Why aren't you uh, uh, allowing people to go in there? And, but you've got to be able to differentiate between, like you said, their preference for certain religious things and and a cult uh, and secrecy. Yeah, I think you're you're dead on, and and, and I really like that concept that. Um, while you may say something is sacred and reserved for certain ways, let's let's show you what this is all about. Let's right. show you what happens. Let's tie this in the in the case of the Latter Day Saints that you talk about. Let's show you how this relates to Solomon's Temple back in the Old Testament, or right. and that there are certain ordinances that are done there, but we don't talk about them. Okay, you know, but the but then when you get to a cult where you say. You don't talk to anybody. You don't travel without two cult members, you know, all the time. Right. You, uh, you give all your money. That's, uh, give all your money is a big difference from pay a tithing like many faiths Correct. believe in. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, those kinds of things start to really make you scratch your head and say, there's a big difference between secrecy and somebody who says this is a sacred thing that we don't just chat about. Yeah. And then uh, remember Sun Young Moon was a big thing uh, back when I went uh, in the 80s when I was living in, in New York and stuff. And he, I remember I was really heartbroken because they bought Entenmann's Donuts, which I loved at the time. And so I couldn't buy them anymore because it's like, I'm not supporting that, you know, but, <laughs> but it's the same thing where he decided who married who and all your money had to go into his organization. And yet really nothing ever came of that as far as I know in terms of prosecutions or arrests or anything like that. Maybe it was because there was no pedophile element to it that we're aware of. And like you say, I mean, if yeah. people want to be told who they can marry and marry them, that's their business. That's not really a crime. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I had a, I had a young woman reach out to me just a few days ago that was uh, sold as a it sold's the wrong word, who was given in a ritual to, as a child bride, she never had a choice to decide. She never had a choice to experience that first kiss with a boy that she thought was really cool. Uh, you know, she, th- when people take away the rights and the, the, those core things that we as human beings deserve, it, it just infuriates me. So I, I have a question. Sorry, Larry, I'm going to jump in here and use your question because I just have to ask this. So who killed King Tut? You know, and, yeah, and Mike. Tell you us about your website. <laughs> tell us about your website, profilingevil.com. Well, so King Tut, what a great experience. Uh, I was actually uh, working. Uh, I was in the I was the chief of staff in the attorney general's office the uh, chief of police of a neighboring city in Salt Lake uh, was a retired FBI agent trained as a criminal profiler. And he and I had been working cases for years and years and discovery channel reached out and said, Hey, we're interviewing 26 
pairs of investigators around the world to look into King Tut's death. How would you investigate this if you were to do so? And having been trained in profiling, we approached it from a behavioral perspective and we laid this thing out and these guys bought off on it and said, hey, we're, we're going to have you two goofballs from Utah go out and try to investigate this thing. And so we said, in order to do that, we got we to gotta, um, vicariously roll in the dirt, go where Tut went. We need, to, we need access to Jeeps and to camels and to hot air balloons. And Discovery Channel bought off and, and put us uh, into business. And we spent about two years investigating that case. And what we actually learned, we think, changed the entire way in which the world has looked at King Tut. Number one, we, we were able to forensically prove that Tut didn't die in the way that all the history books said he did. We were able to prove through doing um, some, some uh, examinations that he had clipophile and that, uh, interestingly, one of the two babies buried in his tomb uh, had clipophile. And, uh, and that was really disturbing because both of those babies, um, one was stillborn and the other one was either dead at birth or, or just before, and we don't know for sure. But um, we, we uh, went through and we looked at the case and we determined as we reviewed the entire case that it was a political assassination. And so we break down the, the suspects one by one. And the fun part about the book is we actually at the end file a uh, arrest affidavit and we list all the <laughs> reasons why and hopefully one day we'll get that served and and uh in the hereafter with we'll that asshole in jail That's yeah right. really <laughs> there's no escape and and we proudly now say you know when we hear an investigator say hey i solved a 50 year old case we kind of ruffle the hair on their head and say good good job buddy but uh, <laughs> ours was 3200 years old That's right <laughs> well you know and, and tut's dad uh, Akhenaten was actually also genetically uh, different. They think he may have had something like Kleinfelters or something. Because when you see the images of him, he's got you know wide hips and uh, long face, and so that obviously carried into King Tut uh, with all the problems he had—a club foot and and uh, the other stuff. So exactly, and you yeah. know the cool thing about Akhenaten is. He had, and and this is really cool because it's about the time that Moses disappears, this is all happening, but he has some kind of a spiritual awakening. And he says, the Amun priests, and if you think back, the Amun priests always, I mean, they believed everything was a God in some way. If somebody put a Pepsi can in front of them, I think they'd probably say, oh my goodness, that's a, that's a God. And, uh, and they said, uh, you know, they were controlling the kingdom and he was losing control. And so I, so I think it's kind of funny because, again, inspiration came at the right time. Akhenaten says, oh, no, there are no more Amun priests. There's only an Aten. And that's why we see his name go to Akhenaten. Right. And uh, he then puts into place this single God process, which then uh, moves the, the group to Akhenaten and sets into motion the murder of his son unknowingly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that, that was actually the origin of uh, monotheism, that they think – they think the Israelites incorporated, uh, and that's that was the inspiration for Moses. You know, uh, the the single deity. I mean, it's a fascinating story, but um, but yeah, I mean, Tutankhamen. Uh, the the whole story of that has changed in large part uh, thanks to you, and we now well, know he's not he's not an ancient alien either. Which that's uh, exactly that's right. right. Uh, you know, and I got to tell you one funny story. So we we uh, when Tuts. Uh, um, artifacts came to the U S a few years ago. The first stop was in Los Angeles and Zai Hawass, the Supreme director of antiquities. And for those that don't know him, it's the guy that always wears the Indiana Jones hat. Yeah, yeah. He's the, he's the big cheese there. We had him on film agreeing with our uh, assessment after the investigation. And when we um, got to the opening of this uh, display in Los Angeles, the media was interviewing him and they said, well, you know, what do you think about the American detectives in their opinion? Well, President Mubarak had gotten to him by that point. And Mubarak, Mubarak made it very clear that there are no assassinations in government. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, Zai says, well, you know, what do you expect from amateur Egyptologists? And so they reached out and said, what do you what do you think of this comment? 
And I said, what can you expect from an amateur criminologist? <laughs> That's great. All you right. Know, well, let's let's talk about your podcast. Now, you, you got a lot of followers on your podcast. They're really popular. So a couple of questions. How do you choose your topics? And, and are there any sort of uh, ongoing investigations right now? I mean, like, for instance, the the Brian uh, Laundry one has sort of come to its conclusion. Not really a cult, but a murder mystery kind of thing. But how do you? What are you investigating now that um, that's taking up your time? You know, we we built uh, profiling evil for a couple of reasons. One is because uh, you know, I other than using YouTube for figuring out how to wire my cabin, I'd never really <laughs> experienced YouTube. <laughs> And my kids talked me into it. And I think they were so tired of my old cop stories. They said one night, hey, why don't you just record one of your old criminal cases and let's see what happens with it. And we did it. And that kind of launched Profiling Evil because for some reason, people were attracted to it. And and uh, and so we had to really make a decision. And my, my thought and decision was that, number one, after the last couple of years of the way law enforcement has um, lived in this environment of, of defund and distrust and everything else that I wanted to focus more on the good that law enforcement was doing and try to, to promote all of the good things and kind of reestablish and rehumanize police officers. And so that was our primary goal. And then I, I wanted to then give a voice to all these families that end up with missing loved ones or homicides in their families that are unsolved. And, you know, you think of the numbers, it's like 875,000 people every single year are reported missing in the United wow. States. Now, the Bureau of Justice says that about 87% of them make it back home. You know, so they got maybe mad at their wife and went to Las Vegas for the weekend or something. But but that leaves <laughs> about 104,000 people every single year that become the Gabby Petitos that right. were that you just mentioned, or right. um, the Suzanne Morphews and, and and others, and I mean that's the size of a big city that just yeah. disappears off the face of the planet. Wow. And so we thought we need to just start reaching out and looking at some of these cases, and looking at cases not based on color, but based on the story, because too often the beautiful little Gabbies that are full of life get lots of attention. But the Lauren DeMolos, who are, you know, a kid facing some drug challenges and a mom with children and a, a broken marriage and a bad job, they just kind of get like, oh, yeah, they died or they disappeared. Right. And so we wanted to give those people a place to live and, and to live on. And it's been really amazing. And, and because of that, it's attracted a lot of attention with big uh, programs that, that are global in nature and others. And we've just been shocked and yet uh, honored to be able to represent some of those families. Oh, well, that's and and, and what, what kind of advice? Sorry. Well, hold on. Okay. Let, me, let me just follow up on that for a second. And that, like, for instance, uh, Mike's son-in-law is a cop. And I, I saw a, uh, a podcast that you did with one of your buddies who was also a cop. And what, you, what, what he said, which I, I know you agree with, and I think we all agree with, is that nobody is more angry and upset about a bad cop than a good cop. And I'm not. Uh, and, and the problem is, uh, and from my uh, uh, point of view, is that <clears throat> I don't think I don't think cops are saying that enough to the public, right? Because, you know, there is this sort of sense that cops, you know, whether it's doctors or lawyers, that cops protect each other, right? And to a certain degree, that's true, because obviously you don't want cops getting charged with, you know, stuff. And it's like, well, that's bullshit. They didn't do anything like that. But on the other hand, when you got this Derek Chauvin guy, you know, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, you know, that guy killed somebody, and he needs to be he needs to be uh, kicked out and shunned by every other cop, and and it needs to be I think forceful and verbalized because I think that's part of the problem why why to a certain degree the perspective about cops and I know Mike you know your son in law complains about that all the time the perspective is skewed now uh, probably the wrong way it's like a pendulum it's gone too far now the other way that eh, all cops are bad until proven otherwise just like lawyers. And contractors, the same right. thing. Right. One bad lawyer, yep. they're they're on the bottom of the of the ocean. 
Yeah. No. Uh, well, yeah. Any profession. I mean, Larry, your p- profession, one, right. one physician who uh, does something inappropriate, then everyone becomes suspect. And, you know, right. it is really troubling. And, and Mike, please thank your son-in-law. I, I just, I just think this is such a noble profession. And my son went into um, policing and, and then uh, got out because he wanted to make some money and he's now selling software to law enforcement and other things. I was so grateful. And yet I wasn't, I was so proud that he was starting to go toward policing, but I am so glad he's not in it. It, it, it is a, uh, it is a mean sport nowadays. Right. And, and I just wanted to kind of tell you a little story that happened just the last couple of weeks. And it'll be a, a podcast that we're going to actually release next week. But I had a, a Latino family reach out to me from San Antonio, Texas, and they said, hey, you know, we know you really like to talk about all the great things cops do, but we want to tell you about a cop that didn't do something great. And uh, 46 years ago, a local town sheriff murdered their son, and they took him out into a desert, and they executed him. And uh, I, I was so compelled by the story. I flew to San Antonio, and I spent four days with the family going to the site that the family dug the grave in hearing about how they were told that they were wetbacks and, and illegal immigrants and, and called derogatorily Mexican. And, uh, and I said to them, when, when did you move to the United States? And they said, well, we've been living here for 400 years. So before the U S was even the U S these yeah. were, we, we came onto their soil and I went to the local police department and the street cops were so cool. And they're like, I've never heard of this story. I've never heard that somebody murdered somebody in my town. And then the police chief reached out to me and discouraged me from doing the story because he said it would shed a bad light on cops. I, I was so offended that, that we're doing the story, not to go after the chief or anyone else, but like that interview where you were talking about, uh, Larry, chief, um, the chief from California that was on with me said, you got to own up to it in order to fix things. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that, that that's absolutely critically in, in, important in all this to really change, change the image. Yeah. So what kind of advice would you give a parent or a grandparent who sees their loved one, maybe their kids or their grandchild slipping into a cult? I mean, what kind of advice would you give them? How, how would they go about discussing that with their loved one and how would they kind of steer them away if it's possible? You know, we we've all been through this as parents where we've watched our children making choices. We were concerned about when you tried to discourage your daughter from marrying your now son-in-law cop, you know, (laughs) the more, the more you try to influence the less influence you have. And so it's really a challenging thing. And that's why I keep talking about over and again, the importance of transparency that we talk about. We say, what do they believe in? What, 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 why do they believe in that? What do you think about that? Um, I had a family from a a polygamous cold in Utah reach out to me two days ago that said, our, our daughter is in love with a boy who's the son of a prophet of one of these polygamous groups. What do we do? And, you know, uh, I said, Mm -hmm. you pray she breaks up because he can tell her he's going to leave the cult, but he's, he's a convert. I mean, he's a generational polygamist. He's going to go back to what he knows. Um, we found this when we were doing the Zion society cult. And when I was investigating ritual crime in Utah is that um, criminals refer back to their belief system. They were taught as children and incorporate that into the way they commit crimes. So they pray like if they were Catholic, they pray like a Catholic in the middle of a child abuse ritual. If they're a Latter-day Saint, they pray like a Latter-day Saint. If they're Buddhist, they respond like a Buddhist. So, Mike, I guess the the answer to your question, in my opinion, which is very limited and narrow, I think, is that transparency is the key. And you just keep praying for them and you keep bringing it up and you keep letting them know that your love is unconditional. If they choose to Mm -hmm. do this, you still love them. There may be consequences of what that does in the relationship, but that you're always there to to help them pick up pieces if they need them. Interesting. Mike, um, this has been fascinating and we're probably going to want to do some more with you as, as uh, definitely want to do more, uh, talk more stories, but let's, let's review real quick. 
uh, hold up your book. This is an amazing book, Deceived. It's available on Amazon. Uh, the soft copy. Hopefully, I can get a hard copy signed by you. We'll, we'll and for me, copy. by the way, hello. Absolutely, I, I'm in your debt. <laughs> right and uh, and then what? The other books are uh, Who Ki- Killed King Tut, and what's the other one? So yeah, yeah, there are a number of books that I did, but the two most recent were are Deceived, which uh, and this, by the way, um, this came after 30 years, and it came after the victims actually reached out and said, "We need our story told." I. Yeah. I I just never felt like it was my. Well, and by the way, it's no. written like a novel. Uh, right. I mean, it's everything in it is true, but I read this basically in uh, like five, six hours because oh. I couldn't put it down. I just kept reading and reading and reading. Uh, so it's 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 a it's not that big of a book, but it's it's packed and it's really really well written. Well, uh, I'll pass that on to Bonnie because she says I write like a police report and she had to turn it into a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and what's yeah. the other book? The, the other, other book, book I'm really excited about, and this one is called She Knew No Fear. And this book is important to me for one primary reason. All my life growing up, my grandfather told me about my great great grandmother who was murdered in 1891 at a town celebration. Wow. The murder was never solved. And I thought, holy smokes, I've spent a career investigating homicide. I need to look into this case. And, uh, and after 10 years of investigation, I found the golden nugget that solved the murder. Wow. wow. That is awesome. Sounds like a movie. Yeah. Are we going to turn it into a movie? Yeah. Only if you can get me in the right hands. Okay. Oh, well, we might. Send us that book as well. I will do so. Okay, um, that's great. This is uh, and awesome. and then again, your podcast is uh, profiling evil on YouTube. Correct, and and uh, and we also have profiling evil on whatever favorite podcast platform they have. And last year we launched and we just started our second season, a podcast in Southeast Asia that has gone crazy. It's number three on Apple's list. Wow, and uh, it's called Mapping Evil with Mike King. And I, I'm working alongside of an award-winning journalist from Australia and, uh, and her beautiful Australian accent and my weird way of thinking. We explore serial killer cases, serial predator cases in the United States, wow. and wow. we compare them to serial murder cases in Australia. And we talk about how while we're a, a half a world apart, the, the behavioral characteristics are very much the same. That, so that's amazing. amazing. We're going to plug that as well. And your, your website is awesome. Oh, thank you. Profileevil.com. Yes. I was playing with it. I was going into neighborhoods and you were showing different houses and what, you know, where a cult could be. And it was very interesting. I loved it. That's very kind, Mike. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think, Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, people are going to really respond to this uh, on, on many levels and so, like I said, we'd love to do another one with you maybe early next year. And you can give us some updates on what you've been doing and what's going on. And in the meantime, we highly recommend that people get the books, read them, and uh, follow Mike uh, on YouTube and uh, on his website. And um, we'll talk to you soon, Mike. That's great. And I want to just plug one thing. Watch November 10th for a brand new Dr. Phil that I just finished uh, that is a really touching story about a murder that occurred 30 years ago. You won't Ooh, lose great. That's yeah. great. November 10th. You got it. Thanks. 2000, 2021. Just, you know, <laughs> yes. if somebody's watching this in 2022, it was already on. <laughs> you can find it on YouTube, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, all right. Well, great. Thanks so much for doing this with us, Mike. And uh, good luck with all your endeavors because you're doing uh, you're doing God's work. Yep. You actually are. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Take care.